Stand together for prayer. O Lord God in heaven, our refuge and our strength, we uh, take our solace and in you, and we are glad to be still and to know that you are God. Uh, we acknowledge, O Lord, that having you with us and in us and for us uh, leaves us safe, and we uh, feel that safety that is to be found in you. Uh, we can lay down, as we sing in the Psalms, our beds. We can lay down our heads upon our, our beds at night and, and a quiet sleep take, knowing that you, O Lord, keep your people, uh, that there is peace uh, that is to be found in you and with you. And we rejoice in that. You, O Lord, are worthy of, of our, all of our praise, all of the praise of all of the sons of, of men and all of the hosts of heaven, and even all of the, the creatures and all of the inanimate creation itself, all ought to be raised in a great anthem of praise to you for all honor and glory and power and dominion uh, belongs to you and to you alone. And so, O oh Lord, take glory to yourself in all that we are about this afternoon and grant that in, in the... Uh, uh, the business that we tend to in, in these ordinances of worship, you would magnify your own name uh, in heaven and here in, in the earth. Uh, we acknowledge, O oh Lord, that uh, we stand in need of you to open our eyes to see the hope of our calling, uh, to enable us to see the, the, the vast inheritance which you have uh, prepared for us to see and grasp the love which you have borne toward us. We need uh, the blinders removed. We need the veil taken away. We need you, O Lord, to give us uh, the sight of faith to behold all of the riches which belong to your people in Christ Jesus. And so we pray, hear our cry for this very thing and answer us. Uh, we, O Lord, are thankful that as we come uh, we come with your name written upon us. Uh, we have been uh, claimed by you. You've taken us unto yourself. And we come not in our own name, bearing uh, our own uh, history and, and uh, circumstances, but we come with all the provisions that you have uh, bequeathed to us in your Son. And so uh, look upon us in the Lord Jesus Christ, and grant, O Lord, that we would be accepted in him who is uh, our beloved. We come as well, O Lord, praying for, for mercy, asking that uh, you would blot out uh, our transgressions. Uh, we, we acknowledge and confess that we have transgressed, and yet we plead that you would blot them out, that you would purge uh, all of our iniquities, and cleanse us from all of our, our sin. Uh, you alone, O oh Lord, can uh, provide this for us. We cannot remove our own sin. Uh, the, st uh, the sons of men are unable to remove the stain of sin, much less the declaration of guilt, but you uh, are able, and you do that very thing for your people. Uh, we wait upon you, O oh Lord, asking that you would uh, bless the, the cause of, of Christ in our, in our midst, that you would awaken the dead, uh, that you would give light to the blind and uh, hearing uh, to the deaf. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would revive your people and that the reviving would be uh, far greater than uh, the, the prosperity known among the wicked in their days of a uh, great harvest where corn and wine is plentiful, that the blessing of the Lord uh, upon us would uh, transcend all of that, that we would uh, know the strength of your right arm, that we would have a sense of, of your presence, and that we would be enabled to ride upon the high places of the earth and to feast with the heritage that we have uh, of Jacob. Uh, grant, O oh Lord, that uh, your uh, people here, and especially the, the, the children, uh, would be given uh, a sp spiritually inquiring uh, hearts and minds, uh, that they would be sober 
and serious, knowing that to whom much is given, much is required, that they would remember that there are both blessings and cursings that come with your covenant, and that you would arrest their hearts and attention, and that you would cause the, power, uh, the word to come to them uh, with, with power. And we, we desire, O oh Lord, uh, not only to have uh, outward conformity, which would bring us no further than, than uh, that of, of the Pharisees in the days of our Lord, uh, but we desire for you to have our hearts, the hearts of our children and of your people, uh, that we would be wed in allegiance uh, to you and devotion uh, to you. Uh, we desire to see uh, you raising up in the generation that rises uh, behind us a great army of uh, God-fearing, uh, serious, and uh, uh, young people who, who love holiness more than uh, the things of this world who, who, like Moses, would esteem uh, the suffering to be had with your people greater than all of the, the pleasures of, of this modern-day uh, Egypt. Uh, grant, O oh Lord, that uh, we would love you with our whole heart and that we would love uh, one another and that we would be enabled to love our enemies. Uh, grant, O oh Lord, that uh, just as the Lord has taught us, you, you send the rain upon the just and uh, the unjust. And you require of us uh, to not only love those who, who love us, uh, but to uh, put ourselves out in giving uh, to the unlovable as well. So, Lord, help us in this uh, manifestation of gospel fruit. We pray for uh, the presbytery in which you've placed us. Encourage and strengthen our brethren as they meet elsewhere uh, in this country, various cities. Grant that they would know your presence, that you would be building them up in grace and the knowledge of Christ Jesus, that there would be spiritual uh, vigor, that there would be uh, added to them numerical growth. We pray that you would raise up as well uh, office bearers with, throughout the presbytery, uh, who would be sent by you to serve uh, your sheep and to care for them. We look to you for these good gifts and pray for your, your mercy. We ask, O oh Lord, for uh, your, your tenderness to be displayed toward those who have suffered great loss. We think of the bereaved, uh, some uh, near to us, and uh, we, Lord, take these, these burdens and we, we bear them up before you and pray that you would help us to weep with those who weep, and that we would speak a word in season and, and seek to, uh, to be strength and uh, consolation uh, to those who, who uh, have lost loved ones. We pray for uh, those uh, who have been among us, who have under discipline, and those who have who've turned away from, from you and uh, your word and your ways, who... Um, exhibit a uh, spiritual uh, recklessness. We love their souls, Lord, and we pray that you, the, the God who leaves the ninety and nine to pursue the one lost sheep, would be pleased to recover and to bring to repentance and to restore in fellowship to you chiefly and with your people as well, uh, those who seem at this point indifferent and uh, to, to the things, to your claims, the claims of, of Christ. So, Lord, pursue and, and bring uh, blessing uh, where there is much heaviness and, and brokenness. Uh, you, O oh Lord, know all of the, the cares that we bring with us, and we are grateful that we are uh, safe and secure in you. Uh, help and uphold us in all of the decisions that lie before your people in their daily life, uh, both large and uh, small, uh, guide with your hand, uh, fill your people with wisdom and knowing uh, what decisions would be uh, best and most glorifying to you. We pray that you would provide jobs for those who have lost them, uh, that you would show yourself strong on their behalf, uh, that you would undertake, and that you would strengthen our faith as we see you uh, providing for daily bread, daily bread for your people. We commit these uh, cares to you. And Lord, help us as we continue to seek your face and reflect upon uh, the truths of your word. Uh, build us up in this truth, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen.
Let's sing together Psalm 59, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 59, verses 1 to 6, to the tune Stornaway, which is tune number 135. Psalm 59, um, like the previous psalm, gives us a description of of the wicked and has coupled with that uh, prayers, cries of imprecation in which we ask for the Lord to overthrow and to bring under his feet all of his enemies. It opens with these words, my God, deliver me from those that are mine enemies and do thou me defend from those that up against me rise. One to six. with me in reading uh, God's Word. Our first reading is found in the Old Testament in the book of Nehemiah and the second chapter, Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. 
Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, uh, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me, when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, uh, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there were come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem, neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night, by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, uh, to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and, and viewed the wall and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us, and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them, and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we, his servants, will arise and build. But ye have no portion nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Amen. We'll continue to seek God's face in song. We'll sing the next section of Psalm 59, which is verses 7 to 13. Psalm 59, 7 to 13, to the tune Bangor, which is tune number 29. The end of this section in verse 13, we sing, In wrath consume them, them consume, that so they may not be, and that in Jacob God doth rule, to the earth's ends let them see. We'll sing together verses 7 to 13.
Let's turn again in the reading of God's Word, this time to the book of Acts. We'll read together Acts chapter 25. Acts chapter 25, beginning at verse 1. Now when Festus was come into the province, after three days he ascended from Caesarea to Jerusalem. Then the high priest and the chief of the Jews informed him against Paul, and besought him, and desired favor against him, that he would send for him to Jerusalem, laying wait in the way to kill him. But Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself would depart shortly thither. Let them therefore, said he, which among you are able, go down with me and accuse this man, if there be any wickedness in him. When he had tarried among them more than ten days, he went down unto Caesarea, and the next day, sitting on the judgment seat, commanded Paul to be brought. And when he was come, the Jews which came down from Jerusalem stood round about and laid many and grievous complaints against Paul, which they could not prove. While he answered for himself, neither against the law of the Jews, neither against the temple, nor yet against Caesar, have I offended anything at all. But Festus, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, answered Paul and said, Wilt thou go up to Jerusalem, and there be judged of these things before me? Then said Paul, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat where I ought to be judged. To the Jews have I done no wrong, as thou very well knowest. For if I be an offender, or have committed anything worthy of death, I refuse not to die. But if there be none of these things, whereof they accuse me, no man may deliver me unto them. I appeal unto Caesar. Then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, Hast thou appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar shalt thou go. And after certain days, King Agrippa and Bernice came unto Caesarea to salute Festus. And when they had been there many days, Festus declared Paul's cause unto the king, saying, There is a certain man left in bonds by Felix, about whom, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me, desiring to have judgment against him. To whom I answered, It is not the manner of the Romans to deliver any man to die before that he which is accused have the accusers face to face and have license to answer for himself concerning the crime laid against him. Therefore, when they were come hither without any delay on the morrow, I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought forth against whom when the accusers stood up, they brought none accusations of such things as I supposed, but had certain questions against him of their own superstition and of one Jesus, which was dead whom Paul affirmed to be alive. But because I doubted of such manner of questions, I asked him whether he would go to Jerusalem and there be judged of these matters. But when Paul had appealed uh, to be reserved unto the hearing of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I might send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said unto Festus, I would also hear the man myself. Tomorrow, said he, thou shalt hear him. And on the morrow, when Agrippa was come, and Bernice with great pomp, and was entered into the place of hearing with the chief captains and principal men of the city, at Festus's commandment, Paul was brought forth. And Festus said, King Agrippa, and all men which are here present with us, ye see this man about whom all the multitude of the Jews have dealt with me, both at Jerusalem and also here, crying that he ought not to live any longer. But when I found that he had committed nothing worthy of death, and that he himself had appealed to Augustus, I have, deli- I have determined to send him, of whom I have no certain thing to write unto my Lord. Wherefore I have brought him forth before you, and specially before thee, O King Agrippa, that after examination had, I might have somewhat to write. For it seemeth to me unreasonable to send a prisoner, and not withal, to signify the crimes laid against him. Amen. God bless the reading of his word. The 
This afternoon we come in our study, our exposition of the book of Nehemiah to the second chapter. So please take your Bibles and turn back with me to the first scripture reading we had this afternoon. We'll be considering together the first half of the chapter, verses 1 to 10. Nehemiah 2, verses 1 to 10. We saw in the first chapter of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's personal preparation for reformation. It began with him, with God's dealings with him, and with the internal exercise of soul and all of the work that God was doing to prepare him in order that he might prepare the people for a work of of reformation. Now we move in chapter 2 from private life Uh, to public duty, from closet uh, to castle, if you will. Uh, And this connection, I think, is important, the connection between uh, the private life of Nehemiah and the public life of Nehemiah. One of the uh, savory treats that Christians have in reading uh, church history, especially Christian biography, is that sometimes when reading the journals or diaries of Uh, godly men and women of the past, we get to peek into uh, the inner chamber of their heart and life, the things that were coursing through their minds, the prayers, the private devotions they were exercised in, all of which tends to cast light on our perspective of their public life, their public uh, ministry in the case of, of ministers and the like. And so it's important for us to hold together this private preparation with the the public uh, preparation. He goes from from prayer, from private prayer. He goes from secret fasting uh, to his daily work in a pagan environment. In other words, he's a lot like many of you who go from the closet and your private exercise of of worship and, and humbling yourself before God into uh, a pagan environment in, in, in the workplace. Uh, he needed the private preparation, but he also needed to be a man of action. And we see both of these things held together beautifully, uh, exemplified in the life of, of Nehemiah, both the private and personal, coupled with the outward and action-oriented a drive of his life. One thinks of the Lord Jesus who uh, went off into the wilderness and engaged in prayer and fasting immediately prior to his, him, him being thrust into the public ministry that God had uh, called him to. So let's consider together uh, five things from uh, Nehemiah 2 verses 1 to 10. First of all, we see Uh, him waiting patiently. So we see something about the need to wait patiently in verse 1. It came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king that wine was before him and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. At the end of chapter 1 there's an earnestness in his prayer. He's he's saying um, Lord I beseech thee let now thine ear be attentive. He's crying out and saying, Lord, today, you know, grant me this crave uh, that I have. But having uh, prayed all of that, he had to wait, and he had to wait specifically for God's timing. We don't know how much time has passed. It could have been a hundred plus days that had passed before the next step, before he was given opportunity to move ahead. But all of the the passionate pleading had to be joined with with, uh, patient waiting. And this, of course, is difficult to do. It's difficult to pray fervently and with faith uh, for things that are are pressing. But that is, in fact, even easier than having to wait patiently. This is difficult. But there is, in the waiting, in waiting on God, not just allowing time to pass under our feet— and, you know, pages of the calendar to be flipped, but to actually be waiting on the Lord, there are all sorts of things that God does with us and in us. There's a, there's a different perspective that is gained that we would not have if we were not left 
uh, waiting on the Lord. So God knows best. And our confidence in his wisdom and sovereign disposal is exercised in waiting upon him. Because we think now, now or never, and yet we have to submit and bring ourselves under the Lord and recognize that when he says not now and not never, but in due course, that he is doing what is best, contrary to our own perspective. So there's an entirely different perspective that's gained. And you and I must learn that behind uh, many of of life's uh, frustrations, there is divine purpose. There is, behind God's sovereign disposal, there is a, a very wise purpose. So we feel flustered, if not frustrated, and sometimes despondent over the Lord's timetable. And we do well when we're taught of the Lord in remembering he has his way. And in his will, there is a, a, a purpose of good, which we must trust. You think of Paul uh, writing to Philippi as we've been reflecting on uh, our study of the, the book of Philippians. Paul can write the people in Philippi who love him, who are... Um, tempted to to sinful worry with regards to him, who are really vaxxed over his imprisonment and so on, Paul writes to Philippi and he says, listen, my time in jail has served to advance the gospel. This is not a holding tank. This is not some holding pattern where I do nothing while I wait for something to happen. Something is happening in the waiting, and God is advancing the gospel through being in in prison. Remember what uh, the first Christians were told, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. And when you don't know the termination, when you don't know, you know, how long it is that you're waiting, It becomes somewhat difficult. You don't know if you're waiting minutes or hours or days or weeks or months or years in a given situation. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Waiting intensifies the thirst that we were speaking about this morning. Even in the the big movements of church history, you think of God raising up this light called Huss or Wycliffe, and there's, there's a desire to see the overthrow of darkness and to see the spread of the, the gospel of light, and yet their lives are snuffed out, and we're caused to wait. History had to wait uh, for a period before the full-blown Reformation came in, in God's uh, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Waiting is never wasted time. It is never a waste of time. So he learns to wait patiently. Secondly, we see faith in the midst of fear in verses 2 and 3. Faith in the midst of fear. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? So the king looks at his executive, his uh, right-hand man, and the king saw in his countenance despondency. You can't hide sadness, can you? You can try, but those who are accustomed to being with you day in and day out We'll find, it, we'll find it rather easy to see when there is really, when there is the, a level of heart-rending despondency. The king recognizes it. You can't hide it. You may feel as if it's imperceptible, but quite to the contrary. And so the king asks him, why is it that you're sad? And at this point, one can imagine that Nehemiah's heart leapt within him. It missed a beat, maybe a few beats, And his breath was probably uh, taken away. Literally, uh, the text says, a terrible fear came over me. A terrible fear came over me. So there's this, unexpectedly, he is gripped 
by a sudden panic. And this is not a fearful man. This is not a timid um, sort of fella, as the rest of the book will demonstrate. He is far from uh, easily uh, disturbed with, with fear. And yet here his heart is held in the grip of, 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 of real fear. This is, not, this is not just the kind of natural uh, phobias that um, can have a power over people. People get claustrophobic in small spaces or they get uh, wheezy uh, in heights or people are scared of spiders or, or, uh, or what have you. Uh, this is at an entirely different level. He's gripped, he's struck with, uh, with a measure of fear. And yet there is in this, this is the very context that is needed for growth in, in faith, for his, his faith to be intensified, uh, for him to have a forum in which the Lord could bring out the exercise of faith. You think of the early church that is being assailed on every side, the religious establishment, the civil establishment, family, there's all sorts of of uh, civil unrest that's taking place, all sorts of things that are happening. They're being assailed on, on all sides, but they, they, they did not lose that serene trust that they had in the Lord. So back to Nehemiah. Remember what Persian uh, monarchs are like. A mere frown before a Persian monarch would likely result in death. So if you compare scripture with scripture, Esther and her story was taking place in the same palace, right? So Esther was just, what, a generation or two before Nehemiah. And so this is familiar territory. And you'll remember when we, pre when we were preaching through Esther, the um, uh, behind some of the apprehension that she had. She knew she was putting her life in her hands when she went before the king without being summoned and all that is associated with that. Well, it's the same place, same sort of tensions and, and circumstances. A mere frown uh, could result in an in instant execution from a Persian monarch. And so the king is inquiring, what's with the despondency, Nehemiah? And he uh, realizing that uh, he has been uncovered, uh, has his heart um, vexed. But it goes on to say, Then I was very sore afraid and said unto the king. So despite the fact that he is struck to the core with fear, grace comes at the time he needs it. He is able to speak rather bold words. I mean, there are thousands of testimonies, some, some of our, our own testimonies, but uh, thousands of testimonies that, that could be trotted out where God is sufficient in a person's worst nightmare. Unexpected, horrific circumstances result in the Lord pouring out the grace needed at, uh, at the time. And so despite the fear, even a fear of death, he is able to say, uh, he is able to speak to the king. Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? And to lay out uh, the state of uh, his, own, his own nation. As more than one person has said, said uh, and I'm not sure who the first was that said it, we are not given dying grace to live by. So God doesn't give you grace now to cope with your fear of death later. He gives you the grace you needed at the time you need it. And so when it's time to die, you're given dying grace. And the Lord does not give us grace to deal with, uh, to, to cope with our sinfully cultivated worries, anxieties about future events. He gives us the grace needed when those circumstances arise. Here is Nehemiah, and he has a confident trust in Jehovah. All of the preparation of those past days now supply him with present courage. All that he was doing and in, 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 in having set before him God himself in worshiping the Lord and humbling himself and reflecting upon the history of God's dealings with his people, all of that preparation now comes to fruition in present courage. You see, Waiting time is not wasted time. 
So as you, 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 you hear sermons that uh, do not intersect with your present circumstances, but they are in many cases preparation for future circumstances. The Lord is equipping us and furnishing us in our reading and hearing sermons and, and so on, furnishing us with the truth and help needed that perhaps around the corner, perhaps sometime in the future, will become overwhelmingly relevant to us, which we'll be very grateful for at, at the time. And so our daily worship and our daily walking with the Lord and our daily repentance and our seeking the face of God and seeking to lay up a treasure house full of spiritual gold and silver, all is useful for when we, when we need it. Well, how is that trust exemplified, this faith in the midst of of fear? Well, uh, our next point, point three, is that we are to be quick to prayer. Notice verse four in the beginning of verse five. We're to be quick to prayer. Then the king said unto me, "For for what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, And if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto uh, Judah. Isn't that interesting? The king asks him the million-dollar question. In essence, what do you want? And what does Nehemiah do? The first thing Nehemiah does, his eyes are open. He's standing before the king face to face. His countenance is fixed upon the king but the inward countenance of his soul is fixed toward heaven. He prays to the God of heaven, and then he answers the king. Question, then prayer, then answer. All packaged together. We noted, was it last week or the week before in our study of Philippians, that prayer is the breath of the Christian life. It is what we do in our ongoing daily walk with the Lord. This is in many ways a high watermark in the history of prayer, this particular text. Here is a man who walks with God. Here is a man who will talk to God and then talk to the king, who who has the thought of prayer before the thought of the words he's going to use to answer uh, the, the question put to him by the king. It's what um, my dad and probably lots of others uh, called when I was growing up a flare prayer. So in the flux of life, in the midst of of circumstances, there are those spontaneous, uh, quick, instant, sincere, silent prayers which are shot heavenward to the Lord in the midst of a conversation or in the midst of circumstances in which we we are crying out to the Lord. So It shows us, doesn't it, the necessity of prayer. So he he has spent days of prayer. We saw that in chapter 1. Days of concentrated, extended, humble prayer, coupled with fasting. You say, Nehemiah, you have spent this massive time for prayer. What what are you doing? You know, why do you need to pray now? You, You spent all of the time previously praying. And yet he knows And we know, and we know he knows, that he did need the prayer at that particular circumstance. Both uh, the the concentrated stated times as well as this spontaneous prayer. Notice that it's immediate prayer. Uh, He did not need, at this juncture, obviously, circumstances would have prevented it, prolonged prayer. Or all of the the, the different parts of prayer that come when when we're... We are alone in our closet. This is a prayer that can be prayed at any moment, in a split second. Ladies who are in the midst of labor and delivery, pray beautiful prayers here. You're driving in the road on an icy road, and there are prayers that we we pray. There are, in the midst of an exam for students, there are prayers that take place, sincere prayers for the Lord's help, in the midst of conversations and other circumstances. Here he is. Nehemiah is in the presence of the Persian monarch. But he knew that he was also in the presence of the throne of heaven at the same time. 
And so he could speak to the great king while speaking to this little K uh, king. And these are the kinds of prayers that take place in preaching and under preaching. There are times when I'm praying flair prayers while I'm preaching. And I hope there are times when you're praying, likewise, while I'm preaching, where we're seeking God's face in these things. It's something natural. Nehemiah knows that he's dependent. The most rational thing in the entire world because of that dependence is to seek the Lord's help to open his heart and mouth, as it were, to the Lord before he opens his heart and mouth to this, this king. It shows intimacy, doesn't it? God is not distant. God is at his right hand. He is communing with the Lord in secret. The Lord is near to him in these circumstances. There's a confidence in the prayer as well. This is the God of heaven who is able to help him. A sovereign that makes this sovereign, Artaxerxes, look puny an omniscient, all-seeing, all-knowing, all-powerful king. But it's also efficacious because he prays to the Lord, so I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, the right words were there at the right time. And probably not only the right words at the right time, but the right manner and disposition and attitude and everything else were there at the right time. Fourthly, we see bold planning. The end of verse, well, second part of verse 5, beginning just after that first phrase, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto him, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah, and a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertain to the house for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. He had spent time in prayer. He had spent time in much meditation. He had spent time in reflection and in uh, gathering wisdom and in planning. And now he has sent up this flare prayer And on the heels of all of that, we have all of this fruit being brought forth. This reflects days of strategy. This is not off the cuff. This is is undoubtedly not a, a thing that's just where he's winging it. Days of strategy are now laid out before the king boldly. From the graves to the gates of the city. This is really an an audacious request. He's basically saying, let me out of the most important job that I could ever dream of in Persia to go do something else. Let me, rather than serving you, your most high monarch, let me go rummage around in a defeated city. And while we're at it, not only do I need an extended period of vacation time, I would like you to foot the bill for my entire project, if, if you would please, uh, King Artaxerxes. You know, he, he anticipates the questions. He has ready answers. I mean, he's saying, um, Asaph, you know, send a letter to the governors to transport me so that I'm safely put there. Make sure you send a separate letter to Asaph so that he'll supply me with the materials that I need both protection and provision he asked for. And it's all there. He has prepared answers to cover both protection and provision from the king. Now, it's interesting, and if you you know your Bible, um, you you can contrast uh, the parallel in the life of Ezra. Remember, they've gone into exile. They come back in three waves. Ezra's the second wave. Nehemiah's the third wave. 
And we reach a point which is very similar in the account of Ezra that we find here in, in Nehemiah. And the king basically says to Ezra, what can I do? How about I foot the bill? And how about I supply protection for you? And how about I do all these other things? And Ezra says no can do. He says no, I won't take anything from you because it is the gracious hand of my God that is upon me. So Ezra is thinking, I want Jehovah to get all of the glory. I don't want the king or anyone else to be able to say the only way we made it was because these Gentiles made it happen for us. We want it to be obvious that it is the Lord. And so the reason behind Ezra's denial of the offer is because of the gracious hand of God. We come to Nehemiah, and Nehemiah not only says yes, I mean, he's so forward as to request it, to put the idea out there, uh, to appeal for it. And why does he do it? The text says, because the gracious hand of his God was upon him. In verse 8, and the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. This is the reason. So it's a similar reason. In fact, you come to verse 18 and it says the same thing. Then I told them of the hand of my God which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. He's crediting the gracious hand of, of God for providing through the king all of these resources. And so different circumstances, same motivation, result in very different approaches to the work of, of reformation. God is ruling over the king. So Nehemiah is in the hand of the king, but the king is in the hand of Jehovah. The Lord holds the heart of the king in his hand and directs it whithersoever he will as a water course. And Nehemiah knew it. Promotion comes neither from the north, south, east, or west. God raises up one, puts down another. And Nehemiah knew it. And so he's, he's looking to God to overrule the king. And lo and behold, there are no obstacles. All of, the, all of the hurdles are speedily and easily removed. Another thing that we might note here is the way in which you have a magistrate, even a Gentile magistrate, who is using his resources for the advancement of the kingdom of God. So a civil ruler as a civil ruler is using the resources that he has available to fund the work of the kingdom, the cause of Zion in the earth. And so this, this touches on uh, one of the, the doctrines of, of uh, the Reformed faith and one of the principles of our own denomination, which we call the establishment principle. That, that, that nations as nations and civil rulers in their civil capacity, um, that it is necessary for them to profess and protect and promote the true religion within their, within their spheres. And this is not the only example. We have several examples within the Old Testament, which proves to, I mean, we have civil magistrates who are using their position and power to advance the good of Zion. But in order that we might be clear, because there are many who would say, well, that's Old Testament thing, that's Jewish, that's gone. The Lord makes it abundantly clear by giving us examples of Gentile magistrates who are doing the same thing for the cause of, of the kingdom. So we shouldn't miss uh, that, that point in passing. But then fifthly, we have bold acting. So there's bold planning followed by bold acting in verses nine and 10. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. If you go back just a, a little bit in, in history, in the return from exile, when the first exiles arrived back at Jerusalem, it was a disaster. And it's still now with Nehemiah's return, a disaster. But when the exile, first exiles came back, uh, it was a disaster, it's ruins. And they had no resources. 
So you have Zechariah who says, not by might, not by power, but by the Spirit, says the Lord. Uh, you have him saying, don't despise a day of small things, right, both in chapter 4. And the point is, those, those first exiles returning had nothing. And God was saying to them, things are very small. This is a very small beginning. Don't despise it. And the power and provisions are from God and not from what you can uh, muster yourselves. Well, here is Nehemiah now in the, th- the third wave of return. And he is, he is acting boldly. He's taking all of the resources that he can um, gather and he is bringing them into the service of, of Jehovah. And do you see the response in, in verse 10? He's not timid. He's not uh, seeking to somehow um, manipulate or weasel his way into a position. He arrives and basically says, I'm here on business and I'm going to do what he knows the last thing they want him to do. And he doesn't care hoot about it. He's going to be bold. And the response is what? It grieved them exceedingly. They are grieved. They are deeply disturbed. San Ballot and Tobiah. We're going to see a lot more of them before it's over. They're deeply disturbed that someone is seeking the reformation, the rebuilding, the reviving of the cause of God, of Jehovah, uh, the cause of Zion in, in Jerusalem. We should note that when God blesses his people, his enemies get nervous. When God blesses his people, his enemies become deeply disturbed. That's a good thing, isn't it? I mean, when, when uh, the enemies of God kind of kick back their head and yawn uh, at the sight and sound of the people of God, the church, preaching of God, all these, these things, and think little of it, that's one thing. But when the Lord comes in might and power, um, there's an entirely different thing, isn't there? We should pray that God would so bless his church with power from on high through the means that he's appointed that the enemies of the church would quake in their boots. In other words, we should be discontent. We should be persevering in prayer until the enemies of the church are pale as white sheets. Their teeth are chattering in their mouth and their, their boots uh, are quaking. You remember what uh, the enemies of of Christ said in the early days of the book of Acts about the New Testament church. They've come to turn the world upside down. And this is a force to be reckoned with, not because of the people, but because of the power from God. It was indeed a force to be reckoned with. And so you come uh, to the, the Protestant Reformation, for example, And God struck terror into the hearts of all of the enemies of Zion. I mean, it's, it's, you've heard it repeated many times now. Queen Mary was a powerful, wicked monarch. She held huge influence and sway. And it is true that she was quaking in her boots. She feared the prayers of John Knox more than all of her enemies. John Knox was not only bold in praying and preparing, but bold in acting. And he would preach in her presence and drive her to tears. And she felt the force, the divine power behind that preaching and those prayers. You think of how the very foundations of the Vatican were being shaken by the work that Calvin was engaged in in Geneva. The reverberations were being felt in Rome, and they were whipping up uh, all of the resources they could muster to somehow stem the tide of what was taking place under the divine hand of God. You think of the fearlessness, uh, the boldness, the, 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 the faith of, of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms, who in the face of, again, ecclesiastical and civil establishments breathing down his neck with all of their 
what seemed to be, humanly speaking, invincible power, he took a stand and struck heart and struck terror into some of their, their hearts. The Lord's people should pray that God would bless his church with power from on high so that the enemies of the church of Zion would be caused, would be driven to, to fear, would be deeply uh, disturbed. You say, well, we, we don't have a John Knox, and that's for sure. We don't have a John Calvin in this generation anywhere, and that's for sure. You say, we don't have a Nehemiah, and that too is, is for sure. There are no great men in our generation but we do have another. We have the Lord Jesus Christ who is walking in the midst of his candlesticks. We have the King of glory. We have the Lord himself who is present amidst and amongst his churches, his people. And that, my friends, is after all, all that matters. That is what is needed most, is the presence and power of the great King who is indeed with us and who will not forsake us and who will not leave us to the end of time. God is our refuge and our strength. He is the one, as we sang in Psalm 46, in the midst of us, with us, and for us. And this at last is what was behind all happening here in these opening pages of Nehemiah and in all of the parallel examples that we can point to in the history of the church. Bold acting comes from having spent time before the face of God. Do you know Martin Luther was put in the vice, and do you know what he said? Give me time. And he went back to his cell, and he spent the night sleepless in prayer. And then he came back, and the well-known words that you've all heard many a time were uttered. The fact is that Nehemiah's bold acting came from the time spent reflecting on who God is, seeing the God of heaven, and reflecting upon the history of God's dealings with his people. The same could be said for Knox and Calvin and others in the history of, of, of the church. It is great and glorious thoughts of God and a profound confidence in his presence that is needed most. May the Lord cultivate and increase that within our own souls. Let's stand together for, for prayer. Our gracious Lord and our God, you are glorious to behold. Teach us to live before your face and presence. Give us an increased acquaintance with your power and might. Help us, O Lord, uh, to uh, wait upon you patiently. Teach us, O Lord, to be still and know that you are God. Uh, grant unto us the exercise of faith in prayer. Help us both in private prayer and in these uh, prayers that take place in the, 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 the flux of, of life. Enable us, O Lord, to be looking heavenward for help. We do pray that you would give us a bold praying and bold planning and a bold acting for your glory and the capacities and places and positions that you have allotted to us as mothers and fathers and in the workplace as students and the various circumstances in which you've called us, enable us to live for your glory and for the good of Zion, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. To respond to the reading and preaching of God's word by singing the last section of Psalm 59, verses 14 to 17. Psalm 59. 14 to 17 to the tune Coles Hill, which is tune number 42. This whole psalm really has, has been a, a providential dovetail with what we saw in, uh, and are seeing in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, the enemies of God's people, the enemies of God, and uh, the cry for the Lord to overthrow them. 
And we, we come to more of that in this, this section, verses 14 to 17. Notice especially the very end, verse 16, But of thy power I'll sing aloud, at morn thy mercy praise. For thou to me my refuge wast, and tower in troublous days. O God, thou art my strength, I will sing praises unto thee. For God is my defense, a God of mercy unto me. Verses 14 to 17. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.